Thank you uh, very much for coming along today. I'd like to kick off proceedings. My name's uh, Senator Richard Di Natale. I'm the leader of the Australian Greens and in a former life I was a drug and alcohol uh, practitioner as well. Um, let me start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people as the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today. Um, it's a great honour to be hosting the Australian Parliamentary Drug Summit with my colleagues Melissa Park and Sharman Stone. We're collectively the co-conveners of the Drug Policy and Law Reform Group here in the Parliament. Uh, it's a group that uh, is very active and has been very active over the past year and I'd like to claim credit for being one of the driving forces behind the medicinal cannabis legislation that has been introduced uh, into the Parliament and acknowledge the efforts of the Health Minister Susan Lee for uh, ensuring that that reform, uh, reform process gets underway. Uh, I'd like to welcome some uh, special guests. We have uh, the Honourable Peter Dunn, who's the Assistant Health Minister uh, in New Zealand. Uh, so I want to say thank you for coming along, Peter. We have Professor Bo Kilmer, who's the co-director of the RAND Institute from the US. Uh, we have uh, the director of the Drug Policy Project, Mr San Ho Tree. All, all international guests, I want to thank you all for coming along. Um, there are far too many people to acknowledge individually. We have uh, other members of parliament. I, know I can see many of my Greens colleagues from state parliaments right across the country. I want to acknowledge you for coming uh, and any other members of parliament who are in the audience at the moment. Um, over the past month, uh, I've had the privilege of travelling around the country to speak to some of the nation's leading drug policy and law reform uh, experts. We've met with doctors and scientists, with former and acting police uh, personnel with judges, um, health service providers, uh, uh, user groups and users themselves, and of course family members of people who have uh, had problems with illicit drugs. Now the experiences of all those people are unique, there's no question about that, but what's really been interesting is the um, collective response towards uh, what we're doing at the moment and the very strong view that uh, what we're doing in many areas isn't working and that we need to start looking to be a little more creative in this space uh, to try and address what is a, a very difficult challenge. And that's why it's so important that we gather here today in the nation's parliament. It's an opportunity to start having uh, an evidence-based debate with some of our nation's policy makers, people in this room. The collective wisdom around this issue is remarkable. Uh, and I think we'll learn a lot from the contributions that we'll hear from a, a number of our expert speakers today. It's an opportunity to have an honest, evidence-based conversation uh, with people from not just across Australia but right around the world. Um, it's an opportunity to listen uh, to their views, to challenge some long-held beliefs uh, and to hopefully go into this discussion with an open mind. Um, there are some things that we're doing very well in this area and we should acknowledge those strengths in the current approach, but we should also recognise that there are some areas in which we're failing and we can do better. We were once a leader in this area uh, through the 80s and 90s, remarkable uh, uh, initiatives, needle and syringe exchange programs, medically supervised injecting facilities and so on, uh, and really leading the world in terms of adopting evidence-based policy. You know, I think it's time to now regain that mantle uh, to start this conversation again, particularly here in the nation's parliament. It's an issue that we haven't addressed, I think, in any uh, uh, concrete way through a public debate uh, in the nation's parliament. Here's an opportunity to be able to do that. So I do look forward to having uh, an open, honest, engaging conversation with the range of speakers that we have here today. Uh, let me firstly introduce uh, uh, Minister Fiona Nash, who's the Deputy Leader of the National Party and she's representing the Prime Minister here today. I want to thank Fiona for agreeing to speak today. It's um, terrific that you've made some time uh, and so I'd like to hand over to Fiona. Thank you very much Richard and firstly can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would really like to extend a very warm welcome uh, to you all today who've travelled here for the Parliamentary uh, Drug Summit. I'd particularly like to welcome the Honourable Peter Dunn from New Zealand, and uh, I've been working with Peter uh, reasonably closely across the, across the Tasman over the period of time that I've been in this role, and indeed uh, at Vienna last year we had some significant discussions around these very, these very issues. 
I'd also want to thank the parliamentary group, of course, uh, Senator Dina Tarley. Thank you, Richard, very much for the invitation to speak this morning. And, of course, Dr Sharman Stone and Melissa Park as well. And also here this morning, Assistant Health Minister Stephen Jones. And our paths do cross fairly regularly in our role. So, Stephen, welcome this morning. I'd like to, as, as a final acknowledgement, to, to thank all who have travelled from interstate and overseas to, to bring your experience here, here to this summit. And I'm particularly pleased to see some of the members here from my Australian National Advisory Council on Alcohol and Drugs. Today's agenda contains a very broad focus uh, in which I do anticipate stimulating discussion. At its core, one that reflects the concern we all have for families and friends and local communities who can be so devastatingly impacted by drug use. And I think in this room everybody understands uh, the very devastating impacts we so often see. When I say we, I do mean all of us. Governments at all levels, NGOs, law enforcement and health authorities, support groups, volunteers and the community. The government's commitment to tackling illicit drug use is unrelenting. We are committed to building safe and healthy communities by reducing the impact of alcohol and drug misuse. That's why we asked the former Chief Commissioner of Police in Victoria, Ken Lay, to join with two eminent health professionals, Professor Richard Murray and Dr Sally McCarthy, to provide the government with the best possible advice about what we could do to show that national leadership to the, uh, show the, national leadership to the rising levels of ice use in the community is so important. And we did that, of course, through the task force process. They provided the government with advice after moving about the country and talking to communities, regional communities in particular, because sadly we know that regional communities are particularly impacted by the drug ice. In December last year, the government responded by investing almost $300 million extra in drug and alcohol rehabilitation, aftercare and prevention measures. It's a multifaceted funding package aimed at improving outcomes for families affected by drug use and aimed at preventing new users starting drug use and improving treatment options for current users. Most importantly, it's an acknowledgement that we simply cannot arrest our way out of the problem. We certainly need to continue our work on the supply chain, but we need to focus on demand and harm reduction strategies. If we're going to break the drug dealer's model, we need to smash demand. And I was particularly proud to have achieved such a significant package of nearly $300 million in what are, what are quite obviously uh, restrained economic times because of the importance that was placed on making sure we had the right response. On the supply side, our law enforcement agencies have been doing a magnificent job finding the people who peddle in this misery and doing all that they can to lock them up and destroy their distribution networks. So while we say, of course, that we can't arrest our way out of the problem, law enforcement absolutely has a role to play. In respect to ICE, we have seen that the weight of ICE seized at our borders has grown 60 times in the past four years. That is a direct result of the additional $88 million we made available for customs to seize contraband that crosses our borders when we came to office. Arrests nationally have increased by 88 per cent since 2010. We have continued to enhance our international cooperation, including sending Australian Crime Commission officers and Australian Federal Police officers up to China to work directly with their counterparts. But as I say, and as these task forces stated, we can't arrest our way out of this. We also have to attack demand. In line with the task force recommendations, our $300 million package includes better targeting and delivery of services. It's no doubt been a landmark policy that is not only tough on criminals who supply this drug, but as I say, investing $300 million over four years for additional drug and alcohol treatment services, prevention activities to reduce demand, and support for families and communities hurt by ICE. This is a game changer in government approach to tackling drug use. Combined with our existing investment, that's a total of more than $600 million over the next four years. I'm really proud that our additional treatment service funding will be delivered through local primary health networks. Local knowledge is absolutely better, in my view, than Canberra hypothesising. I'm very pleased that we reinstated the anti-ice advertising. 
which the Stancombe research has found has convinced 51% of at-risk youth who saw the ads to avoid using ice. And I think that's a tremendous outcome. I know there have been various views about, uh, about the advertising, but when we see the evidence actually showing a positive outcome, I think that's very good news. I'm also delighted to note in December that COAG, as part of the National Ice Action Strategy, agreed to a new ministerial forum on alcohol and drugs. The forum will bring together health and law enforcement ministers with a view to the Commonwealth and states enhancing best practice and collaborating to tackle these difficult issues. The forum is intended to oversee Australia's national drug policy framework and report on progress being made and emerging trends to COAG. One of the first pieces of business I look forward to discussing with my state and territory counterparts is finalising the next national drug strategy and the national alcohol strategy. National frameworks built on a strong evidence base. Obviously, as you here are all aware, the media spotlight can often turn to the use of illicit substances and Australia's relatively high intake of illicit substances. In my time as the Minister for Rural Health, I've seen firsthand the impacts of alcohol and tobacco, particularly on our acute and primary care health settings. The government's committed to promoting responsible alcohol consumption in the community and is undertaking a range of activities to support this, including funding of $19 million over four years to continue the successful Good Sports program. And I do have to say, they are an absolute standout and doing brilliant work across our communities. Funding of $9.2 million over four years to support activity under the Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders National Action Plan. And I particularly want to note uh, the work that Dr Sharman Stone has done in this area. Indeed, she has been a leader in the, in the government's response to how we're going to tackle this devastating issue. Funding to support the Positive Choices Online Portal, which facilitates access to current interactive and evidence-based drug prevention programs for teachers, as well as education and information resources on alcohol and other drugs for parents, students and teachers. Support for the National Health and Medical Research Council's Australian Guidelines to reduce health risks from drinking alcohol. There is currently, uh, currently planning underway for a review of these guidelines and leading the development of the next national alcohol strategy in collaboration with the states and territories, which I do look forward to discussing at the Ministerial Forum later this year. The Australian National Advisory Council on Alcohol and Drugs has also been tasked with providing the government with advice around reducing alcohol-related harms and gaps in existing evidence. In addition, I do note the strong bipartisanship in respect to tackling tobacco ranging from graphic health warning labels to plain packaging. There is still a lot to be done. But the fact that smoking rates since 1991 have reduced from one in four Australians to just over 12 per cent is a wonderful milestone and should show all that while we may not always agree on everything in this place, uh, we can at time across parties come together to achieve good public health outcomes. In closing, thank you again for the opportunity to be here this morning, and I do apologise I'm not able to stay. I was very keen to, but unfortunately um, some commitments preclude me from doing that. So there's no doubt it is a tremendously challenging policy space. There's no simple solution, as we all know. So let's all treat this as the complex challenge that it is, and I wish you very well in today's deliberations and very much look forward to hearing the outcomes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fiona. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Stephen Jones, MP, who's the Shadow Assistant Minister for Health, and he's here representing the opposition leader. Often you hear about uh, you know, what you see from this place are the differences between people, but Stephen and I are probably on the same page on a lot of issues, and particularly on this issue. Uh, I think he's going to be a very strong and important advocate for sensible and evidence-based reform, so I want to thank you for agreeing to come. I noticed you're done yourself an injury there, but um, thanks for coming along, Stephen. Cheers. <clears throat> uh, thanks very much, Richard, for your warm introduction and the proceed to my speech. Uh, it was excellent. Uh, talking about evidence-based policy, I working, was working on some evidence of whether the angle could, the, uh, angle could work at right angles uh, to uh, the rest of the leg during a, a weekend run. The evidence is in, and this is the result. <laughs> Look, I'm really delighted to be here at the gathering of parliamentarians for drug reform. It's a non-partisan cause which I'm very, very happy to associate myself with. 
It's great to see so many practitioners, frontline workers, researchers and members of the judicial community come to Canberra to engage uh, in a conversation around the important issue of illicit drug law reform. You're all too numerous to mention, so I won't be able to um, single out every one of you. I do want to um, thank you, uh, the Associate Minister for Health from New Zealand, for coming across the ditch to come and talk to us. Peter Dunn, it's great to have you here. And you've had a bunch of your colleagues uh, in town and in the building over the last couple of days, and it's been fantastic to engage with them. Um, it's also good to see Bo Kilmer from the RAND Corporation, who's come all the way from the United States to share uh, the learnings that are going on across there. Of course, I want to acknowledge Fiona, who spoke this morning, uh, Fiona Nash MP, uh, sorry, Senator Fiona Nash, the uh, uh, Assistant Minister for Health and the Minister for Rural Health. Uh, great to have uh, Sharman Stone here, um, uh, the member uh, uh, for Murray, who's been outspoken on these issues and many other for many, many years, and my good mate, uh, the member for Fremantle, Melissa Park. For the parliamentarians who've come from interstate, great to see you. And I'm so delighted to see uh, the member for Summer Hill, uh, Joe Halen, here with us in New South Wales, a person to watch in the New South Wales Parliament. I know this because I stood alongside her at our New South Wales Parli uh, uh, Parliamentary Party meeting uh, in the Town Hall in Sydney uh, two weeks ago. And for those of you who know anything about New South Wales Labor politics, it's a willing affair. And Joe got up and um, did what most commentators would call uh, introduced a very courageous motion, uh, and that was a motion uh, calling on the New South Wales Party to reassociate itself with its reformist path. Uh, the great advances made by um, Bob Hawke, uh, by Bob Carr, um, in reviewing our tr approach to uh, the criminalisation of drug laws of harm reduction and us exploring new approaches to that. And I know you're going to be an important voice uh, in this important debate, uh, Joe, so great to have you along here. Australian governments are spending in excess of $1.7 billion annually combating illicit drugs. This includes police detection and arrests for drug crimes, policing the borders of Australia for importation prevention programs, treatment services and harm reduction programs. From the total pot of $1.7 billion, 65% is spent on supply reduction via law enforcement. But just 22% is spent on treatment services, 9.5% on client-focused prevention services, and a measly 2.2% on harm reduction. So out of that total $1.7 billion, less than 2.2% is spent on harm reduction. The question we have to ask ourselves, and I'm certain that everybody who's attended today has already asked themselves, is whether we've got the policies right and the priorities right. Is this the most efficient way for us to be spending our money? Before I came to Parliament, I worked as a community worker for many years in the western suburbs of Sydney and in the Illawarra. I also worked as a lawyer. Um, and when I turned my mind to this area, I drew upon that experience. It was clear to me then, as it is now, that what we're doing in this area isn't working. It's simply not working. We need to build our policies on the best available evidence and research from Australia and also around the globe. Around the globe. Treatment provides the best return on government investment. We know that, but it's not getting anywhere near the share of investment that it deserves. I strongly believe that we need to adopt a health-based approach rather than relying on measures that might be filling our jails but are doing very little to stem the supply of drugs or the harm caused. I had a wry smile on my face and the Minister for Justice is, in my view, the Federal Minister for Justice, a good man who tries very hard in the portfolio that has been assigned to him. But, uh, a few months ago in Federal Parliament, he was speaking about the additional resources that have been put into methamphetamine um, in addiction, um, the additional resources that have been put towards customs, border protection and policing, and then marvelled and asked us all to marvel with him that despite that, there had actually been an increase in the availability of methamphetamine uh, and a decrease in the street price of methamphetamine. Um, we actually know 
that. We don't need to do any more studies. We know that irrespective of the money that we are putting into law enforcement, and this is absolutely no criticism of the men and women who are working hard day in, day out around our border protection, our interdiction, our policing, um, that the supply of drugs remains stubborn and often intolerant to the policing efforts. Over the last uh, year, I've spent as much time as I could when not in Parliament visiting the many services throughout the country, uh, whether they be clinics, treatment services. I've also visited a number of jails around the place. I recently visited the Solaris Therapeutic Community Program, which is a voluntary treatment program run at the Alexander McConaughey uh, Remand Centre down the road, the jail in Canberra. I sat in on one of their treatment services. Um, I wasn't surprised, as I'm sure uh, the majority of you wouldn't be surprised, that the majority of people who were sitting in there were men of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander background. I had the opportunity to talk to them after the, their morning session. I spoke to them in the exercise yard. I wanted to know the path that led them from where they were to becoming incarcerated and acknowledging that they had a drug or alcohol problem. So I, I asked the question, how old were you when you first saw that your life was going off track? How old were you when you first recalled that you started to have a problem with alcohol or another drug? Over the half the group did not get to double digits. The average response was you know, maybe 11 or 12, and all of them you know, had grown up in households where some other member of the family had a drug or alcohol problem, along with a range of other issues. I then recounted the story um, to some of my colleagues about the feedback that I'd got from treatment. Workers in the front line, many of you are here today that I've met uh, over the course of the last 12 months. And, I asked them about the backgrounds to the people that they're dealing with in treatment facilities. They t I don't have hard data on this, but they tell me that over 90% of the people they are dealing with for a drug or alcohol addiction problem are also dealing with some other underlying trauma. Maybe it's a, a, a childhood abuse, sexual or otherwise. Maybe there's family or domestic violence going on. Maybe there's an injury, a workplace or car accident injury, and they've moved from taking a prescription opioid to dealing uh, uh, with other mental health issues, and that has been the path on which they've taken uh, towards having a substance abuse issue. And it strikes me if we know that, if we know that kids are finding their way on the pathway from addiction to jail from the earliest age of below 10, or we've got people in treatment facilities today who the underlying cause of their problem uh, is not a weakness of personality, as we're often encouraged to believe, but a, a violence or some other trauma. Why are we turning this into a crime? Why are we spending the majority of the state's resources on this issue uh, in policing instead of looking at the underlying health issue? The work that is done by the RAND Policy Research Centre tells that the, you know, the treatment for, um, is 10 to 15 times more cost effective than any of the uh, policing or law enforcement interventions at reducing serious drug related crimes. Well, this accords with the experience uh, that I've picked up as I visited the centres around the country. So these are questions that government, of government spending often influenced by, but they're also separate from law reform and law enforcement activities. We have to ask ourselves, as we clamour for tougher and tougher penalties, we know that a criminal sanction is the most